Now we're going to start on part two of the history of microbiology by Dr. Roderick L. Roll. So that concludes the early years. Now we're going to move to the golden age. So back to our concept map, we're on the second branch of this uh, massive tree, the golden age. The golden age. For 50 years, the field of microbiology have had been trying to address uh, four answers um, to four questions. All right, so many scientists had been running experiments to try to answer these four questions. And we're going to run through four questions and uh, about 30 different scientists that contributed to the answers to those questions. So this is how we answer questions in science. It's called the scientific approach, science method or scientific inquiry. All right, so the scientific method is a approach used to explain certain natural phenomena. That's the scientific method. Um, we have another term called a hypothesis. A hypothesis is a tentative answer to the observations that were made in nature, in the wild. So I observe something. I come up with an answer to the observations. After I come up with the answer, then I have to design an experiment to test my hypothesis. So that is the scientific approach. That is a scientific method. Now, we have um, exception of our hypothesis or rejection of our hypothesis. If we accept our hypothesis, um, we're done. We're done with the experiment. <clears throat> if we do not accept our hypothesis, we reject it, then we can redesign experiments. Maybe the experimentation was fraud, was flawed, or um, the answer was just wrong. Then finally, we have theories. A theory, when a general concept is accepted time and time again by data. So we run the experiment, we get the answer to the question. Somebody else runs the experiment in a different way and gets and achieves the same answer. Third party does it and achieves the same answer, but everybody did it different ways. This now becomes a theory. When general concept is accepted time and time again by data, by experimentation, it is gonna be called the theory. We're going to talk about something called the germ theory. So the germ theory is going to be a combination of many different scientific experiments that really come up with the same type data. <clears throat> As technology evolves, scientists will retest theories. So um, think about uh, taxonomy and how at first, people were just looking at the physical characteristics and they put everything into categories. But as technology evolved, they had to reclassify things. They had to put things into different categories because technology evolved. All right. So this explains what theories are. And then finally, we have a law. Uh, we're not going to spend any time on law because that's really um, in physics. So we don't have too many laws in a biology or a microbiology class.
So during the golden age of microbiology, they had four questions. So we're going to address each one of these questions. So late 1800s to the early 1900s, we looked at four questions. The first question is, is spontaneous generation possible? What is spontaneous generation? That is when something just spontaneously appears. So people thought that things just spontaneously appeared. So that is our first question. Is spontaneous generation possible? All right. Now, some philosophers and scientists of the past thought living things arose from three processes. Asexual reproduction, sexual reproduction, or from non-living matter, spontaneous generation. So a long time ago, these great thinkers, these great minds thought that things arose in these three ways. Asexual reproduction is when a cell uh, splits in half. It makes two cells. That's asexual. So you don't get any genetic variation. You just get the same. So if I was a cell and I cut me in half and each halves created a new Dr. Roll, that would be asexual reproduction. Sexual reproduction is when I transfer half of my genetic material, the female transfers her half of the genetic material, and we make something new. This new thing is not exactly the same as either one of the old things. So that is sexual reproduction. And then finally, we have the non-living matter um, or spontaneous generation. Uh, something just materializes out of the atmosphere and creates something. So philosophers thought uh, life was created in these three ways. So let's go way back to Aristotle. Uh, 384 to 322 BC, Aristotle proposed spontaneous generation. He had observed things just spontaneously appearing. So he gave validity to this statement that spontaneous generation occurred. So, and he actually had evidence. So here's some evidence where a uh, toad arises from a dried up lake bed. So here's a lake bed, um, it's dried up, and then all of a sudden when it rains and it floods, people saw frogs, people saw toads. So this gave those people the assumption that things spontaneously appeared. All right, so this was a long time ago. Now we don't believe this now, but I'm showing you how the evolution of our knowledge, where it came from. So, Aristotle thought that things spontaneously appeared. So scientists came after and they tested these theories where they tested the hypothesis. The tentative assumption was that things appeared. So Reddy designed an experiment to test that answer. All right. So in the late 1600s, scientists started to doubt Aristotle. So this led Reddy to run an experiment. And now how did his experiment work? He took three flasks. One flask had was unsealed and he put meat in it. And what happened in that flask? Well, uh, flies landed on the meat in the flask and they laid their eggs and the eggs hatched into more flies. The second flask was sealed and it had meat in it also. The third flask had a cover over it, but it was just regular gauze. So air could get in versus flask two, no air could get in. So in flask two, no things grew nothing no flies um spontaneously appeared over here uh 
flies did not spontaneously appear inside the flask, but they did spontaneously or grow on the outside of the gauze. So in the late 1600s, uh, Aristotle ran this, exp I mean, um, Reddy ran this experiment. So, in his experiment, he saw that animals only come from other animals. He looked at the flies. He said, well, based on um, flask number two, nothing spontaneously appears. So, we're going to modify our tentative answer, all right, that things spontaneously appeared. He's going to modify it and say, okay, look. Animals do not spontaneously appear, but maybe microbes do. So let's look at our second bullet. Scientists did not believe animals could arise spontaneously. Why? Because of Reddy's experiment. But they did believe microbes could spontaneously appear. All right, so this was uh, the general consensus after Reddy's experiment. The next scientist was Needham. Needham had a, a different experiment. Needham's experiments, uh, he experimented with beef broth in, in a gravy-infused plant material matrix. So he added all these things to a flask. So over here to the bottom right corner, you see we have a flask. So just imagine you put a little beef extract in here, make a little gravy by boiling it, it have a little infusion of some plant materials with vitamins and stuff in it and a cup of fiber and starch for some sugars. So if you have all that in this flask, that's what Needham did. Now, he boiled uh, this, this solution and the solution turned cloudy. This uh, uh, conclusion of the cloudy a uh, mixture reinforced the idea that microbes arose spontaneously. So remember in this flask, if it is clear after the experiment, this means that nothing grew. But if it turns cloudy over hours and days of growing, that means that microbes spontaneously appeared. So this was a uh, Needham's experiment. And remember now, he sealed this. So over here to the right corner, he put this cork on top of this uh, Erlenmeyer flask after he sterilized everything by boiling it. So if you close this container, nothing falls into the container, nothing should grow, but something grew. So Needham's experiment gave more validity to the concept that microbes did spontaneously appear. So it reinforced Reddy's original experiment. Then we had another guy, Spallazzani. Spallazzani devised an experiment in 1799. Now, what he did was he boiled um, his solution for an, over an hour. So, um, Reddy then, then boiled his as long as, as Spallazzani. So, Spallazzani exported his for, uh, boiled his for an extremely long time. Then, he sealed the top by melting the slender neck of the flask. So, he just took the neck of the flask and melted it together would basically is going to seal it close. Now, Spallazzini got the opposite results of Reddy. Spallazzini had no growth, but Reddy had growth. So these two scientists contradict uh, each other's experiment. So Spallazzani's experiment concluded that Needham failed to, to heat the vials sufficiently to kill all microbes or that Needham 
had not sealed his vials tight enough. So if he didn't seal his vials tight enough, then things could have fell in to the I mean, could have fell into the flask. So that's why Spallanzini heated his and closed it up. All right. And Spallanzini's experiment concluded that no spontaneous generation of microbes occurred. So just the opposite results of reading, of ready. Now, critics uh, of Spallanzini stated their opposition. <clears throat> critics said that the sealed vials did not allow enough air for organisms to survive and that prolonged heating destroyed the life force. So now these critics created a, 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 a different concept. Um, you see a new term, life force. Well, what is a life force? So they said, well, Spallanzini, your experiment was good, but we don't believe yours. We're going to believe ready because yours sealed it in such a way that no air was able to get in. And you prolong the heating so long that it destroyed what is called the life force. So the life force um, statement created a, a new debate that was like a side note to the spontaneous generation of microbes um, uh, hypothesis. So this slide shows you what type of uh, test tubes and test tube uh, caps we use now. So here is the cap and it has these four um, indentions on the cap. You put the cap on top of a test tube. Here's my crew drawing test tube. And as you can see, since it has these indentions, it will not let the cap go all the way down on the test tube. So let's say there's a, a millimeter of gap in between the lid and the test tube. That gap creates a current of air. So the air is going to come up and into the micro, I mean, into the uh, test tube. Therefore, um, eliminating the entire debate on the life force. All right. So nowadays we use test tubes to grow all types of things. All right. And we put these, these sterile caps on top of the test tube, but it creates a sterile environment because the cap is on it, but it also allows air to flow into the test tube and to nourish the microbes that are growing. So this is a, a new test tube and what we use nowadays to um, not even have to have the debate on the life force. We're gonna talk about a guy named Louis Pasteur. So we talked about Aristotle, we talked about um, Reddy, we talked about Spallanzini, all right? Um, so now we're going to talk about Pasteur and what he did. Pasteur used a special type of flask. It was a swan neck flask. So he bent the neck of the flask into a S shape. So down here, if you look at this S shape, that's the end of the flask. Remember, um, Spallanzini just heated the end of it and closed it off so no air can get in. But Pasture made a swan neck so it is open down here on the end. So therefore, air can get into the tube and come up through here. But as long as air is not falling directly in, it's not going to contaminate it. If the air has to come up and around, just like on the previous slide, the air will stay sterile. All of the debris and dirt will be collected here and dust will collect here and not contaminate my solution over here. So this is something that Pasteur invented, the bent neck flask. They call it the swan neck. 
So uh, this bullet says, bent the neck into S shape, which allowed air to enter, but not microbes. This disproved the life force debate. Here's another picture to show you how the swan neck flask works. Um, all of the dust and bacteria are going to be collected down here into the S part of the, of the neck. And the air will just travel directly on up. So therefore, in the end, this media will be sterile. This slide is going to talk about the scientific method. Um, the scientific method is a series of steps that all scientists go through in order to publish papers and to run experiments. It's a, a sequential step process that we use. All right. How was it invented? It was, it was created, um, over the spontaneous debate. So the debate over spontaneous generation drove scientists to come up with a standard of how we're going to address questions from now on. So a group of observations led scientists to ask questions about some phenomena. The scientist generates a potential answer um, to the question. That potential answer is called a hypothesis, a tentative assumption to some observations. Then scientists are going to design and conduct experiments to test their tentative assumption. They're going to design experiment and then they're going to run the experiment. After they run the experiment, they're going to collect their data. And then after they collect their data, they're going to discuss their data and then they're going to conclude um, what the results mean. And in the conclusion, they're going to either accept their uh, hypothesis or they're going to reject their hypothesis. So based on observations, results from the experiment, scientists will accept, reject, or modify their hypothesis. Now we're going to take a 15-minute break while we um, work on this coloring activity called spontaneous generation. Now we're going to move to the second question. What causes fermentation? All right, so that's question number two. We just finished addressing spontaneous generation. So now um, we're going to cover fermentation. Vintners are people that produce wine. Vintners funded research into how to promote um, good alcohol. See, back in the day, alcohol would get spoiled. And spoilage of alcohol back in the day was created by an acid. And Vintners did not understand what created the acid in their wine. So... To create wine, you want alcohol to be made. You don't want an acid to be made. So these vintners funded research into figuring out what is causing this spoilage. Some scientists believed air caused fermentation while others insisted living organisms caused fermentation. As you can see, this is going to be linked to the debate over spontaneous generation. If air can ferment uh, the wine, then we are going to have to, it gives more validity to the spontaneous generation of microbes. But if you believe that living organisms um, are going to cause fermentation, 
then you, you would not believe in the spontaneous generation of microbes. So we go back to our boy, Louis Pasteur. Um, he was going to receive most of these, this, these funds from the Vintners. So in 1860s, um, Louis Pasteur had a short series of publications on this matter. Um, he helped discover uh, the theory of spontaneous generation of microorganisms, along with this other guy named John Tyndall. So, like I stated, he disproved the theory of spontaneous generation. All right, with his swan neck flask, he was able to show, like, look, this solution is not going to turn cloudy, which means, which symbolizes that a microbe is present. If this solution doesn't turn cloudy, that means there's no microbes and I have to actually introduce microbes. I have to put the microbes in this flask for it in order for the microbe, I mean the flask to turn cloudy. This slide is illustrating Lewis Pasteur's experiment. All right. Pasteur's experiment were on pasteurization. So let's look at it. He had four questions we're going to address in this uh, slide. His first question was spontaneous fermentation occurs. What he did was he took some grape juice um, and he was he heated the grape juice. So here's my, my flame. He heated the grape juice. He heated the grape juice long enough to kill all the microbes in it. Then the flask was sealed. So day two, the flask had a cork in it. It was sealed. Observations. And then after you do your observations, you collect your data. Observations, no fermentation occurred. Juice remained free of microbes. So data was collected. They tested the juice. The juice had no acid. The juice had no alcohol. The juice had no microbes. So, conclusion, you reject the hypothesis. The hypothesis was what? Spontaneous fermentation occurred. Nope, it was rejected. Here's my second hypothesis. Air ferments grape juice. Air does it. So, Pasteur used the swan neck flask for this one. He boiled the grape juice. He used swan neck. Air was able to still come in, but not the microbes. All right. The flask remained open. Air came in. Um, air nourished the microbes in here. Observation. No fermentation occurred. Juice remained free of microbes. So there was no alcohol produced and there's no microbes. So what? We are going to reject hypothesis two. Hypothesis two states that air fermented grape juice. So that was our second question or answer. This brings us to our third tentative answer. Bacteria ferment grape juice into alcohol. So Pasteur's experiment said, well, what we're going to do now is we're going to add bacteria into the grape juice. So we have our flask, we have our grape juice, we have our heating source. We boil it, we sterilize the grape juice. There's nothing in it now. Juice in the flask is inoculated. Inoculate means to introduce. We're going to introduce bacteria into this vat, um, to this flask, and we're going to seal it. All right. Now the bacteria is in the flask, 
Bacteria has a sugar source. Bacteria are going to eat the sugar and multiply and divide and reproduce. Bacteria are going to be produced. They saw this in their observations. Acids are produced. They characterize the, in, the, the content of the grape juice and saw that it was acidic. So, in their conclusion, they modified hypothesis 3. Hypothesis 3 was bacteria ferment grape juice into alcohol, but alcohol was not produced and acid was produced. So they therefore modified their hypothesis. Bacteria ferment grape juice into acid. Finally, we have the fourth tentative answer. Yeast ferment grape juice into alcohol. Since bacteria doesn't do it, maybe yeast will. So Pasteur designed this experiment also. He took a flask with grape juice. He heated it sufficiently to kill all the microbes. He then seeded the flask by inoculating it with yeast. He sealed the flask and allowed the yeast to reproduce. When they looked at their observations, they noticed that yeast were reproduced in the flask and alcohol was present. So therefore they accepted hypothesis four, yeast ferment grape juice into alcohol. So I hope we understand how scientists run experiments. They look at something that occurs in nature. They make observations. After making the observations, they come up with a tentative answer to what they saw. Then they design an experiment to test that tentative answer. The, the process that they come up with might not always work. And when it doesn't work, they have to modify their hypothesis. All right, so that's what I just showed you with Lewis Pasteur's experiments show you the methodical step-by-step uh, -step process that scientists do every day when they run experiments. But at the end of Pasteur's experiment, he was able to say what produced alcohol, what produced acid, and he was able to show that microbes exist and what they did. One microbe called bacteria produced the acid. Another microbe called yeast produced the alcohol. So this was a very uh, uh, expensive experimentation that saved Vintners a lot of money after he concluded his experiments. The next slide talks about a, a new scientist, Birchner. Birchner had an experiment that did not use cells. He extracted enzymes from yeast cells. Now, how did he do it? He used what is called a mortar, this bowl, with a pestle. And he took sand and put it into this mortar. He took yeast cells and put it into this mortar. He put water into this mortar and he grinded it up. So he ground the, the different particles until he ruptured the cells together, therefore releasing a filtrate. The filtrate had the enzymes in it. Then he filtered through a funnel the solution. All of the very small particles went through and the larger particles stayed up here. The sand, the big, large cellular debris like organelles, like cell membranes stayed up in the filter paper. And what came through was just a filtrate that contained the enzymes. All right. Then he took sugarcane and he boiled sugarcane. 
sterilized sugarcane, and then he added uh, the filtrate, which contained the enzyme, to the sugarcane and sealed it. By sealing it, the it had no oxygen. The enzyme metabolized the sugar cane and converted it into alcohol. He had a control that ran, ran simultaneously with the experiment. At the bottom shows you his control. We have the sugar cane juice being sterilized. He did not add filtrate, so he, therefore he did not add the enzyme. And in the end, at the end of the experiment, no fermentation occurred in that flask. So he was able to prove that not just the yeast cell produce alcohol. He was able to show that the enzymes from within the yeast cell can produce alcohol. So that was uh, Bursner's experiment using no cells. This last slide is going to show uh, other products that we obtain from fermentation of sugars. The vintners are not the only people to profit off of fermentation. We can also get food products and different chemicals that we use day to day from fermentation. So let's run through some of them. The first one over here on the left is a microbe that will produce Swiss cheese. All right, it will produce this product, which is Swiss cheese. This, the next category, the next column, shows three different microbes that produce lactic acid. And what is lactic acid used for? Making um, cheddar cheese, yogurt, and soy sauce. The third column shows you that this micro, which is called a yeast, is going to be used to make this byproduct through fermentation. This ethanol is what you're going to see in wine, beer, and alcohol. The fourth column, Clostridium, is a microbe that will produce acetone or isopropanol. What are these used for? They're used to make nail polish remover and rubbing alcohol. Then finally we have the fourth, I mean the fifth column. The fifth column has these two microbes that are going to produce uh, acetic acid as a byproduct. And what is acetic acid used for? Vinegar. All right, so all of these microbes are going to produce byproducts in the absence of oxygen. When I remove oxygen from the equation, it is called fermentation. So not only the vintners profited off of alcohol production, the food industry also profits off of fermentation. This brings us to our next coloring activity, the germ theory. We're gonna take 15 minutes and color this activity on the germ theory which has two parts, a wine and acidic juice. This brings us to our third question. What causes diseases? Pasteur developed the germ theory of infectious diseases in 1857. Since he knew the bacteria cause spoilage with his Vintner's experiment, he knew that if bacteria contaminated the alcohol and made it become acidic by adding acid, then maybe the bacteria contaminated the blood of a human and made them sick. So he proposed the germ theory based on all of these different experiments that people have been that people had been seeing and gathering information on. So he proposed the germ theory.
Pasteur later developed a weakened strain for um, foul cholera, and he saw that this microbe caused it. He developed a weakened strain for anthrax. Um, he saw that this microbe caused it, and he developed a weakened strain um, for rabies, and he saw that this virus caused that. So this is what Pasteur um, did in addition to helping the wine and beer industry. Pasteur named the weakened strains of these microbes vaccines. So this is where we come up with uh, the term vaccine from. His whole process of taking this microbe like Bacillus anthracis and not giving the patient this bacteria, because this would kill them, but he would give them a weakened strain of that microbe, and then they would not develop the actual sickness. That is called a vaccine. This creation of these weakened strains uh, evolved into a new field called immunology. So immunology is this field of looking at um, what's in the blood, what's in the blood and how it works. So we're still on the question of what causes disease. Um, uh, we're not going to just talk about pasture because he was not the only person that was significant at the time with this question. There's another guy named Robert Koch. Robert Koch studied the causative agent of diseases. Now, when you find out what caused a disease, it is called etiology, the study of what causes the disease. All right. Yes, you have a runny nose, but what caused it? So if someone studied what caused your runny nose, that would be etiology, the study of that process. So that's what Robert Koch is uh is doing in this slide anthrax which we know kills humans we know it kills animals um it is primarily fatal to animals it also can cause ulcerations of the skin what robert Koch did was that he found that this bacterium bacillus anthracis caused anthrax in humans now you can get anthrax in animals too now so but what Koch did was he found that in humans, Bacillus anthracis caused anthrax. Um, this other guy in the last bullet, um, Davian, in 1850, he saw that anthrax was in the blood of cattle and that that was the etiology of the cattle getting sick from anthrax. The next slide talks about Koch. Koch is going to devise what is called the Koch postulate, and he also designed many uh, experiments or techniques that we use in a lab today. So we'll first talk about one of his more notable um, contributions, the, the Koch postulate. This is where he's going to look at a, a diseased victim. He's going to isolate something from the disease victim. He's going to take blood. He's going to take pus or sputum. He's going to take those, one of them, and he's going to inoculate it onto gelatin or a potato slice. So basically, he's going to culture that microbe outside of the body. Then he's going to infect an animal with the inoculum. The inoculum is what he takes from the potato slice. Now, that animal should develop that disease. So this is what Koch is noted for. It's called the Koch postulate. He is also noted for coming up with these different uh, laboratory techniques. So let's run through them. Number one, simple staining techniques. 
So he devised these simple staining techniques so that you can actually see the bacteria. Number two, he first photographed the microbes. So it's called a photo micrograph of bacteria. He was the first to come up with that. He was also the first to photo micrograph bacteria in diseased tissue. So here's my bacteria over here on the left, and here's my bacteria inside of tissue. This tissue is blood. So this is a photo micrograph of diseased bacteria in the actual tissue itself. Then number four, uh, techniques for estimating the uh, colony forming units in milliliters. So the bacteria in a solution based on the number of colonies on a solid surface. So he devised a mathematical formula where based on counting the number of colonies on a solid solution, he was able to estimate how many colony forming units were in blood per milliliter. All right, so that was the fourth techniques that um, Kosh developed. The sixth thing, the fifth thing that Kosh discovered was the use of steam sterilized media. Above bullet five, you see an autoclave. This autoclave is used, um, it creates pressure and it creates a vapor, the steam. It is going to sterilize media. Number six, the use of petri dishes. Over to the right in that lady's hand is a petri dish. It has a gelatin mix. Uh, or seaweed mix, and it is going to be used to grow microbes. Number seven, aseptic technique. I can teach you an aseptic technique. What it is is to transfer a solution from one place to another without contaminating it. That is aseptic transfer or a aseptic technique. And finally, number eight, bacteria as distinct species. So the microbes, the bacteria that we're going to look at, are actually distinct species. So what gave this patient diarrhea is a specific bacteria called Escherichia coli. That is a distinct species of bacteria. So, Kosh discovered what causes tuberculosis. Now, how did he do that? He did, he used his technique that I mentioned earlier called the Kosh postulate. And from utilizing that technique, he discovered that mycobacterium tuberculosis caused tuberculosis. Utilizing his uh, many laboratory procedures, he saw that that bacteria was rod-shaped. He was able to see it under the microscope. He was able to draw a micro, uh, a photo micrograph of it. And he actually won the Nobel Prize in 1905 for discovering that. Now, he disproved that tuberculosis was inherited. So before 1905, people thought that you developed um, tuberculosis because you inherited it from your parents or your grandparents. So in 1905, he disproved that. No, it's not caused from a genetic disorder. It's caused by you being exposed to a bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis. This is the step-by-step -step process of the cost postulate. It is a series of steps to elucidate the cause of any infectious disease. So this was practiced for a hundred, a hundred years. All right. How do you know what made this person sick? You have to use the cost postulate. And once you just determine who did it, that is called etiology. So step number one, mycobacterium tuberculosis is found in every patient with TB. 
but it's absent in healthy patients. So we have two rooms. One room has all sick patients. The second room has all healthy patients. I go into the room with all sick patients and I isolate sputum, blood from each patient. And in each patient, I see this rod-shaped bacteria called Mycobacterium tuberculosis in each patient. Step two, mycobacterium tuberculosis must be isolated and grown outside of the body. So I isolate from each patient. I grow it on a petri dish from each patient that was sick. The healthy patients don't have it. So that's step two. Step three, when mycobacterium is introduced into healthy patients, susceptible host the host must get tb so notice what they're doing they isolated the bacteria they grew the bacteria now they're going to take the bacteria and put it into healthy patients that were in the other room that's step three step four mycobacterium must be re-isolated from diseased experimental host. So I had two rooms of people. I had healthy people and sick people. Now I have two rooms of sick people because I performed the Koch postulate. By doing this, I've discovered the etiology of what makes these people sick. It is mycobacterium tuberculosis. Mr. Kosh won a Nobel Prize for this. Now we're going to spend some time working on a coloring activity on the Kosh postulate. I'm going to give you 15 minutes to do that. This slide is just a table to show you. Look at the first scientist, Robert Kosh, 1876. Disease that he discovered was anthrax. The etiology, he discovered that Bacillus anthracis was the causative agent of that. Um, under that, they just got different scientists and what they discovered, the etiology of dis the diseases that they discovered. Um, the last question of the golden age is how can we prevent infections and diseases? That's our final question. So how can we prevent it? Well, Semmelweis said, wash your hands. That's how you prevent it. So Semmelweis made medical students wash hands with chlorinated lime water. Um, when his students were leaving the autopsy rooms, their hands were very dirty. So just by making his students wash their hands, he reduced the mortality rate of his patients. So this reduced streptococcal infections from 18.3 to 1.3. So his patients developed a disease called purple fever. Purple fever the etiology of it is, it's caused by streptococcus, purple fever. So the mortality rate of women after giving birth used to be 18.3%. This was in the 1930s, I mean 1830s. After the 1830s, it re was reduced to 1.3% just by making them wash their hands with chlorinated lime water. So how can we prevent infections and disease? By cleaning yourself, by washing your hands. So that's one of them. Unfortunately, Semmelweis died from the same bacteria that he saved patients from. He died of a streptococcal infection. <laughs> In 
It was believed that bacteria in wounds caused pus formation. So a new scientist called Lister, he said, well, let's use this uh, antiseptic technique I've created. What I want you to do is spray on the wound. I want you to put it on the surgical incisions and the dressings. I want you to put this stuff called phenol. Now, phenol is nothing more than um, carbolic acid. And all we're going to do is put this on the wound. We're going to put it on the surgical incision and we're going to put it on the dressings. And by doing that, he reduced the mortality rate by two thirds just by cleaning the wounds. Nightingale. Nightingale saved hundreds of lives because she introduced cleanliness to nursing. All right, we got these bed sheets. We just had patient A in here. We had to amputate his leg. All right, we moved patient A away. Now we're going to take the sheets out and bring new sheets in. So just by introducing cleanliness to the environment, she was able to save lives. So that's what Nightingale is uh, commonly known for. Snow. Snow looked at the spread of a disease, the uh, epidemiology. All right, so what did he do? He looked at a, a, a cholera outbreak. So he carefully documented uh, a cholera outbreak around a public watering hole. So in the middle of the city, there was a water supply. And he noticed that people were, were sick in this community. And after interviewing the patients that were sick, he saw that all of them uh, frequented, frequented, frequently went to um, a, um, a watering hole downtown. So he was able to see that the spread of this disease was caused by this watering hole. This is also called epidemiology. We talked about this earlier. What is cholera? Cholera is caused by vibrio cholerae, a microbe. You have headaches. You have stomach pains. You're going to have vomiting. You're going to have rice water colored diarrhea. And you might die. So these patients were dying back then. And Snow was able to track the source of this infection. And by knowing where this source came from, the people could just... Uh, bypass the source and then therefore not get sick. So what caused cholera? The etiology of cholera is Vibrio cholerae. Who discovered it? Robert Koch. So Snow just looked at the spread, the epidemiology, but Robert Koch actually isolated the microbe from the rice colored diarrhea then gave it to healthy patients and then they got rice water diarrhea thank you robert kosh the next one is uh edward jenner all right, Edward Jenner saw that milkmaids rarely got smallpox. And he discovered that they rarely got smallpox because they were exposed to a mild form of smallpox while they worked. The mild form of smallpox is cowpox. So Edward Jenner noticed this. This concept was going to be linked to immunization. I can immunize somebody. I can protect somebody from this major form of smallpox by giving them this minor form called cowpox.
So what Jenner did in 1796, he inoculated a boy with pus from a cowpox lesion. This um, gave the boy cowpox. But the boy would then be protected from smallpox. So the boy will, would develop immunity against cowpox. Then if he ever were exposed to the real deal, which is smallpox, he wouldn't die. So this is what Edward Jenner did. And this led to the field of immunology. So here's Edward Jenner inoculating the boy with cowpox. Where did he get it from? Cowpox lesions. So now the boy was safe to smallpox and he would not die if he got smallpox. Edward Jenner knew of this practice before the 19th century because previously in the first part of the talk I told you that Asia, Africa, North America had been doing this for hundreds of years. Now we have Ehrlich. Ehrlich um, looked at aniline dye. Now, so aniline dye, uh, I used to make up this stuff. You take a, a stone like this and you grind it up into a powder and you mix it with water and you make a dye, a stain with it. This stain can be used to stain bacteria with. So Ehrlich found out that this aniline dye could stain parts of a microbe. So he envisioned creating a magic bullet. A magic bullet will be a chemical that destroy the pathogen while remaining non-toxic to humans. Since this stain would stain bacteria, he said, well, if I could find the right stain that would kill the bacteria, then I would turn it into a pill, give it to the patient. When it's inside of the patient, the chemical would incorporate with the microbe and kill the microbe and not the cells. So this concept is called the magic bullet. Now Ehrlich discovered many drugs, but only a few actually worked. So in 1908, Ehrlich discovered a drug against the microbe Tryponema pallidum. Tryponema pallidum is the causative agent of syphilis. In this slide, this is a blood slide. That is my red blood cells. And this is the microbe. It is Tryponema pallidum. It causes syphilis. Ehrlich discovered a drug that would target this microbe. All right. So he searched hundreds of drugs to try to find one that actually was a magic bullet. And here's one that he discovered. 